Infosys is using AI, they're a client of mine, <clears throat> to predict future events, and they're doing it very successfully. They have put <clears throat> about 30 sensors on different oil rigs, uh, temperature, vibration, air pressure. Sound turns out to be a very important indicator of stress in mechanical systems. And they've put these sensors all over the place, and they add meteorological data, wave data, and a few other things. And they just sat back and waited to see what the AI robot would, would learn. A cool story, as I was told by emphasis, the machine starts to drop uh, messages, uncomfortable messages. You know, uh, we are unhappy about the oil rig that's in front of you. But the following week, it blew up. Uh, the, the AI was, was not able to, to say what was wrong or what was going to go wrong. But the AI did locate where. And it said, uh, you know, on the fourth pillar on the left hand side, just where that tug is, about three meters down, it's going to be an explosion. It didn't know why. And the people didn't know why, so they'd ignored it. I'll tell you, the second time the, the uh, yellow light started to flash, they got on the phone to BP. <laughs> <laughs> and from now on, they take it very seriously. Now, this is typical of AI. We haven't a clue. No one's, no one's a faintest clue of what, how the AI is working. Not a clue. Um, it's not that the robot knows anything. It doesn't. It's just matching data. We think that the sound data is very important. It's probably more important than anything. But we can't work it out at the moment. But all we know is that the AI system is better than human beings. Um, we've done the same with fiber optic cables. There are signals you can detect to do with latency uh, of electronic signals. How long the electronic signals take to go from A to B through a 3,500 mile system. Emphasis are now routinely informing BT about which of their fiber optic cables need to be inspected before it fails. And they're usually right. So this is a hugely important for us and is also becoming important for banks, payment houses and the rest. I've done a lot of work with them and they are using exactly the same techniques now to try and detect fraud. But we don't necessarily know how the system knows that there's a fraud. It's just that they're often right. And it's something to do with origination, transaction patterns, location, IP data, fingerprinting, you know, all kinds of things you can give the AI. For instance, I hold my phone at a distinctive angle when I type my passcode in. Uh, we can detect that. We can store the angle at which I, I use my phone and probably tell which more or less which finger I'm using to punch things it, by the way that the phone's moving. We can use phone motion data in addition to all the other things. Keyboard pressure we can detect, intonation in voice. All this stuff is fascinating and rich data for AI. But, of course, people are getting good at playing games with this. For instance, you've probably all of you seen videos now of President Putin saying things that are very rude or Obama saying things which are rubbish, things that he's never said. These videos are becoming near perfect. At the moment, they're using actors' voices, but the, the imaging of, of the lip sync is perfect and the expressions are perfect. <clears throat> and we are now, the AI is getting to the point where it can reproduce the, the uh, original person's voice with additional words. Now we'll start to enter very strange territory where actually we'd be foolish indeed to believe any photograph that we see or indeed any video clip. Yet a video clip could trigger a war. Wars have been triggered by less. And we're also in a strange situation where the AI is starting to um, decide permissions. Permissions that might, might start off to be sort of esoteric and not really important, but they're now becoming fundamental to life. It's almost impossible now to get a job without a LinkedIn page. It's the primary method of recruitment for probably between 40 and 60% of my clients. They will start looking on LinkedIn for new people. And if they can't find a LinkedIn profile of someone who's got it sent in a CV, they won't proceed with selection. It's easy to lose your LinkedIn status. <laughs> if you're not careful, you'll find the algorithm, not a human being, has blocked you from YouTube, uh, of, of LinkedIn, because of, I don't know what. It could be uh, some bizarre sequence of things. Uh, AI is doing all kinds of things. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad. So for instance, um, regularly, some of my clients say they can't see my own website, Global Change has had 15 million different IP addresses at it. Uh, there's only me that makes that website. Uh, it's had maybe 9 million video views. But despite that, some of my clients say, I, I, you know, I say I'm on the call, I say, I, can I show you some pages? This is what I would do for you. Because I can't see it. And I say, oh, because, because uh, it's blocked. It's blocked. And well, the reason it's blocked is because it's got asset pages in there. <laughs> and Sarah will know this. Because their page is about asset, and asset is about sex education, um, and because the company doesn't allow them to watch porn, and they think the site's pornographic. Porn pornographic. So well, we can laugh about it, but actually it wouldn't be, be laughing matter if it was my LinkedIn profile. Mm. But those decisions have been made by robots and they're only reversed by human beings.
And of course, human beings <clears throat> take a long time. Uh, same is happening with credit cards. So you can get uh, very helpful, all kinds of algorithms being used to try and detect fraud, but they're oversensitive at the moment. I'm sure you've all had this. You've had situations where actually your card has been declined because there's a suspicious transaction. It's you. You've done something unusual and they don't like it. So they've declined you. Actually, she and I have been traveling quite a lot recently and I'm, I'm looking at a wallet. We have about, I've got about eight credit cards in my wallet for the simple fact that if one gets declined, the computer start, the AI systems of the other card issuers start taking up and they talk to each other. The robots talk to each other before you know where you are. All my cards are broken. Every single one. And I'm traveling and I, I'm paralyzed. I can't move. I, I, my, 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 my human rights to move have been declined by the system. Difficult to sort out, especially if it's three o'clock in, in the morning UK time and we're somewhere else. In China, this is particularly an issue. There's a system being built at the moment which gives a social score, a lack of credit score to every single human being in China. It's not fully complete yet, but it's well on the way. And that social score includes things like whether you're a volunteer, uh, whether you pay your taxes on time, um, whether you are, have a good credit rating, whether you're known to be kind to your neighbours, whether you have a criminal record, whether you shout abusive things against the government on Twitter or its equivalent. Um, if your social score falls below a certain amount, you're not allowed to travel. I don't know if you put up your hands if you knew that. You can't get a real ticket. Or you can get an air ticket, but you can't get a real ticket. You have to use, and you can't get a real ticket. You have to go by bus. A link to this is uh, a fascinating improvements in face recognition. Um, not just face recognition, but they had to change that because of masks. Uh, but gait. I've broken my ankle, which means I'm not, I'm unfortunately, I'm unrecognizable for the next six weeks. I'm still limping. But once I'm mended, I will be recognizable again by the way I walk. Does it matter? Yes, it might. The state system has more powerful controls, even without AI, than, than anyone could ever have imagined 20 years ago. Um, drones are being used as the primary method of war at the moment. And we're just beginning the drone revolution. And the future of drone warfare will be swarms, that is, not just the 20 drones and a few missiles going over, but maybe four or 5,000 drones all going through the air at once, and all of them are the size of a briefcase or smaller. Um, uh, you can't be controlling 4,000 drones, and they will be controlling each other on a network, uh, operating under certain rules, and they will be um, targeting um, hardware, military hardware on the other side. Um, well, but they could, we've got the technology already, if we think about what China's doing, to have a very interesting situation where already we've got these things which have taken out senior leaders that are considered undesirable, let's say in Afghanistan, taken out by some drone operator who's sitting, let's say, in, in Delhi using on-the-ground data plus photos. Um, but we have the technology to use a much smaller drone already, a drone that would cost maybe a thousand pounds sort of drone that your children might own, uh, to drop the drone down to in a busy street, someone's getting into the car, drop the drone down to just about eye height for about 30 seconds, just to do a photo match. You get the photo match and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kill order and the drone just goes straight in. Now you don't need a weapon, you just need the blades to be made of, of very, very sharp razor blades. And that's all it takes just very sharp metal blades and the person's gone so this is an area this is the area where ai will come under the greatest scrutiny is in war but you can be sure you see what's happening in russia at the moment there's always a progression of ethical change during wartime so during war we in the uk uh, approved and organized large-scale carpet bombing of cities where there were largely men were at war and mainly women and children left. That happened during the war under the British administration. We just celebrated the death of one of the Dambusters just this week. So ethics get stretched during wartime. And the ethics of AI, whatever the rules are agreed with AI about AI, they will go the same way as the Geneva Convention has gone in the current conflict, go straight out the window the moment we're actually in a situation. Now, in this context, we've also got 
new worlds. Now, there's nothing new about this, new worlds. These are old worlds. Um, over 20 years ago, I, I, I joined Second Life, which is a virtual world where you can uh, have an, an uh, you know, you can get married, you can have children, you can do whatever you like. You can buy and sell uh, uh, stock, you can build homes, uh, you can have conversations. All very interesting, but ultimately I found it extremely boring and left it. But it's still going. Some people have second lives and um, it's a very important part of their existence. I've also always thought it's a bit bonkers. Um, so, I, and, you know, 20 years ago, I started experimenting with headsets like this. And Metaverse is totally dependent on this kind of technology. I have to say it's not very much improved in my view. I've tried on the Metaverse yeah. headsets. I'm not sure how many of you... Put your hands up if you've got one of these on your Christmas list. 